churchmilitant.tv would like to extend to you an invitation to participate in the first annual Bishop Fulton Sheen Gala being held on April the 5th. And get this, the dinner is both real and virtual. For those not able to attend in person, we will be live streaming the dinner. Now, if you're asking yourself, how can I go to a dinner over the internet, then just click on the attached link. Please make it a point to check it out. It will be the first ever of its kind in the world, all in honor of Bishop Fulton Sheen and in an effort to bring Christ to the internet. Just click on the link. God love you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Vortex, where lies and falsehoods are trapped and exposed. I'm Michael Vorce. When Pope Benedict freed the traditional Latin mass from the stranglehold of liberal bishops and weak-kneed establishment types who think the Latin mass is the biggest boogeyman to hit the church in the last 1,400 years, he opened up a much larger debate than just a particular worship style or a rite. The debate is shaping up to be one over Vatican II, now, to be certain, almost every debate and issue in the church in the past 50 years has happened against the backdrop of the drama of what transpired in Rome between 1962 and 1965. Quietly lurking in the background of every clash, from ordinary parish council meetings, where which hymnals to purchase for the congregation, to diocesan policies regarding who's allowed to speak on church property, has been the interpretation of the council. All those things are decided based on the interpretation of the council. Much of what has happened at the council has been shoved down people's throats in a manner reminiscent of a prison guard domineering a prisoner. All kinds of things have been done in the name of the council that the council never said a word about, much of it evidenced by untold abuses in the mass. But more than just visible examples, there are even more dangerous philosophical ideologies that betray the very nature of what the church is. There is the indifferentism that has seized many clergy and by extension many, many laity with regard to the superiority of the Catholic faith, which it is. That belief now reigns supreme in many chanceries around the world. Even if it is unspoken most of the time, it still hangs in the air and is precisely what is inhaled on a daily basis. Hand in hand with that is the incredibly stupid notion that we can have a reasonable hope that no one goes to hell. What a boorish position to maintain. Boorish because it directly contradicts the words of God himself, of our blessed Savior himself, who flat out says in St. Matthew's Gospel that on the last day he will separate the sheep from the goats and he will say to the goats, depart from me, you accursed into everlasting fire. But this combination of beliefs that one, no one or almost no one really goes to hell and two, that Catholicism isn't really all that special. This combination has proved to be a near deadly one-two knockout punch for hundreds of millions of Catholics. And it all stems from the battle over Vatican II. Benedict himself said that what happened in the wake of Vatican II, the misrepresentations of the council, were so dominant that they, quote, created so many calamities, so many problems, so much suffering, seminaries closed, convents closed, banal liturgy. The majority of Catholics today look with suspicion on anything that began before 1965, the dreaded pre-Vatican II days, and any writing from any pope before Blessed John the 23rd is treated with disdain or at least suspicion. Many Catholics today, including many young, well-intentioned Catholics, have been raised to think of the church as something that came into being only since 1965, and that the preceding 1900 plus years were kind of a dress rehearsal for the full blossoming that we have only now reached. This is taught in classes that lay people take in parishes and seminaries all over the United States. If not directly, then certainly indirectly. Popes prior to the 20th century are rarely mentioned. Their writings are never or only very rarely ever referenced. It is the modernists in the church that have created what Benedict rightly called a rupture, and they have ridden that rupture all the way to the bank as they have cashed in on a near total remaking of the church. Young Catholics today, ones who are involved in youth ministries and the like, who are very well-intentioned and willing to give the church a chance, know next to nothing 
They have been weaned on emotions and feelings and warm and fuzzy liturgies from which they have learned nothing. They have been taught to ignore anything that came before Vatican II and quietly suspect that anyone who speaks this message as some kind of subversive who has time traveled to the present from the torture chambers of the evil and wicked inquisitors of the 16th century. And of course, what else can you expect? The soft-minded clergy who want to be popular among this set have not told them the whole truth. They have not imparted to them even a portion of the authentic faith, have told them almost no church history. In short, they have created a generation of 20 and 30-somethings who don't know what they don't know. And the caricature of those who do know as some kind of pre-Vatican II troglodytes, mean, judgmental, uncharitable, is communicated informally in front of classes of students and formally in quiet discussions in hallways and coffee lounges and rectories. This attitude has become institutionalized to such a degree that it will be impossible for the new pope to ignore it. In fact, whatever he says and does will be viewed precisely through this prism by the new church gang down at the local chancery or the local parish. As he was leaving office, Pope Benedict cleared the decks for this work to get underway, the work of taking back the council and asserting what it actually said. It did not say, let's have an army of Eucharistic ministers at Mass. Let's have lay people giving homilies. Let's have altar girls. Let's receive Holy Communion in the hand. Let's turn the altar around and face the people. Let's stand up for reception of Holy Communion. Let's have nuns hike up their habits and then eventually toss them away. Let's teach dissent in the seminaries. Let's allow a flow of homosexuals into the priesthood, thus creating a powerful and vindictive subculture. Let's rip every statue and piece of sacred art out of our churches and replace them with tasteless, twisted pieces of metal that even the artist can't figure out what it is. Let's rip out the communion rails. Let's get rid of the notion of sacrifice and replace it with a meal on a table. Let's dump Latin and treat it like it's illegal. Let's get rid of Gregorian chant and substitute it with guitars and drums and Protestant-style Christian rock bands. Let's dump confession because, well, no one really sins anymore. And let's dump the teaching on sin because, well, hell is so blasé and medieval. None of this, not one blessed thing did Vatican II mandate or even begin to anticipate. The Council Fathers would die a second death if they were to come back today and look at what has, what has been made of their Council. Could even the most well-intentioned Catholics today talk intelligently about, for example, grace and the distinction between sanctifying and actual grace, for example? And more importantly, why knowing that distinction and living by that knowledge could spell the difference between eternal life and eternal damnation? Benedict says as much when he talks about the rupture. A tremendous rupture has occurred in the wake of Vatican II, and the future of the church in the West may very likely rest on the shoulders of that man who steps out on the loggia when his former brother, when his former brother cardinals have done their duty. What many people do not know is that Pope Benedict was the last active bishop who actually attended the Second Vatican Council. With his retirement, the next pope will be truly the first of the next generation, the first of the post-Vatican II era of popes. Pray that the Holy Spirit sends us the pope we need, not the pope we deserve. God love you. I'm Michael Voris. Sick of TV and its cultural rot? Tune in to churchmilitant.tv and become a premium subscriber where you will get access to fresh shows with solid church doctrine. As a premium subscriber, you'll get hundreds of hours of programming, which includes investigative shows, catechesis, apologetics, church history lessons, and a lot more. What are you waiting for? Forget the bad television and dive into the riches of the Catholic faith for only $10 a month.